So we've just introduced GDP as a measure of the total sum of goods and services that is produced in an economy in a given year. Uh, here we're going to, I'm going to change the way this PowerPoint is laid out a little bit and break it down for you. In this section where we want to take a, a quick look at long run economic growth, we'll come back and take a look at that in a later chapter, but it'll, it'll be helpful to introduce the idea here and as we develop our aggregate demand and aggregate supply model here in, in a module or two. And then we'll also take a look at the business cycle. So that's going to be the fluctuations. So long run growth here and then the business cycle. When we're talking about long run economic growth, we're talking about rising productivity over time. So increasing in increasing standards of living over time. A lot of times we're going to use GDP per capita, real GDP per capita. So that is, a, you know, holding the price level constant, adjusting for price level. So we're moving any inflation effects. Real GDP measured in real goods and services, actual goods and services, not dollars. So real GDP per capita, we'll take a look at that over time as a measure of long run economic growth. Remember, using GDP is not a perfect measure. We talked about that before, but it is still a helpful measure. So the trend in real GDP over time is pretty significant increase. This is, of course, going, looking in the United States from 1900 to 2010. Uh, it's risen more than eightfold. So now Americans can buy more than eight times as many goods and services now than they could back in 1900. And remember, this is adjusting for inflation. So yes, prices have risen, but we, we're accounting for that. So this is more than an eightfold increase accounting for inflation. If you wanted to calculate the growth in real GDP from one year to another, you can use our, our familiar formula, new minus old over old times 100. So here is in 2014 would be the new, here's the old, so new minus old over old times 100. So that is a 2.4 2 uh, percentage change. We could do this over a couple of years to find the approximate annual rate of growth. So um, growth in 2012, growth in 2013, growth in 2014, and then just taking the average. This gives us an approximate annual rate of growth of 2.3%. If we're doing this for a lot of periods, we wouldn't want to go through and add up all those percentage percentages for each year and then take the average. So this is what we would do instead. Um, a helpful rule you can think about uh, is this rule of 70. So this is going to be for any kind of growth formula. Um, you might use it in biology, but we're, we, of course, are looking at economics here. So any variable to double, the number of years to double is equal to 70 over the growth rate. So if the growth rate were 5% a year, so if real GDP is on average increasing 5% a year, that means that in 14 years, 70 divided by the growth rate, and notice that is just um, straight up by 5, not, not, you're not dividing by 5%, it is the growth rate here. So 70 divided by 5 is 14. So that means that in 14 years, if the growth rate were 5%, real GDP would, jump, would double. So before you, you know, even in the span of less than a generation, purchasing power, the ability to buy, to buy goods and services would increase, would double in 14 years if the growth rate were 5% over that time. So why can the average American consume eight times as many goods and services now than they could back in 1900? The answer here is labor productivity. Um, this is the quantity of goods and services that can be produced by one or worker by one hour of work. So uh, a worker can produce more in a shorter amount of time. So when we think about, and this is, so this is, this is really why real GDP grows over time is through labor productivity. So when we ask what determines the long rate of growth, uh, we want to be careful to answer here, especially what determines labor productivity growth. So what would make laborers more productive? Capital would be a, a major factor in this. Remember, capital is just, it's a good that's used to produce other things. So it could be anything from a wheelbarrow to a computer to um, software, any, any of those kind of things. Um, this, and we're also including here under capital, you can think about human capital, which would just be the knowledge and skill that workers have, maybe through training like education or on the job experience, any of those things that would affect how productive a worker can be. Associated with this would be technological change as well. So if there are improvements in capital or methods, like how inputs are put together. You can think about Henry Ford in the assembly line, for example, or um, uh, microprocessors, any of those kind of technological change that would increase workers' productivity. Um, and then al alongside technological change, you also have entrepreneurs who are, um, 
I would make a distinction between entrepreneurs and inventors. They aren't necessarily the same people. Inventors are the people who come up with these technological changes here, but entrepreneurs are actually the ones who find a way to bring them to the market. So classic example here would be Steve Jobs. It's not like he in invented the smartphone, but he found a way exactly to bring it to the market in a way that consumers wanted. Secure property rights are also going to play a big role in labor productivity. Uh, people aren't going to want to produce if someone can come along and take what they've made. You have no incentive to, uh, to do research, to work hard. You know, if somebody's just going to come along and steal it, if the contracts can't be enforced, there's not going to be in any incentive to, to work hard and to, you know, increase productivity. So government has a role here in establishing an independent court uh, that enforces contracts and enforces property rights. We're just introducing the idea here. We'll spend a lot more time on this in Chapter 16. So if, if you have questions or are interested in this, in this field, it'll be in Chapter 16 of your textbook. We'll hit it in a later module. We want to distinguish between two kinds of GDP. Potential is just the, the what is what would be possible if firms and workers were acti were working at normal capacity. So but this is going to increase as the labor force expands, when capital stock increases, or when new technologies are created. Potential GDP in the U.S. has been growing at about 3.3 percent every year. Um, the thing that we want to distinguish potential GDP from is actual GDP. So this is what is possible given current capacity and technology and workforce and actual GDP is what actually happens. So during a recession that especially we'll see a gap between potential and actual GDP. You can see that here. Uh, here's the recession 2007 to 2009 that gap increases and notice that even here the kind of the growth rate slows down even in potential GDP during the recession. That was a quick introduction to long run growth. That will be helpful as you look at long run aggregate supply in the next in the next module. And like I said, we'll come back to the factors that contribute to long run growth in a later chapter, chapter 16 of your textbook. Here we want to take a look now at short run fluctuations in, in real GDP. So we've seen this general trend of increase. Uh, it's increased eightfold since 1900, but it hasn't risen consistently every year. So there are periods of uh, increase and decrease in real GDP in booms and busts and re uh, recessions and growth periods. And these alternating periods are called the business cycle. Here's a smoothed out version of what I'm talking about with the business cycle. We see a general upward trend in real GDP, but during this short period here, we have an increase and then a fall. This um, expansion here is just the increasing GDP that's measured to the peak of this um, graph right here, just the highest point. We, re we measure recessions, periods of declining real GDP from the peak to the trough. So you see that's why this recession, it starts at the peak and goes to the trough. So a lot of times you'll hear like, oh, when did the recession end? When did it begin? There's a lot of lags with the data, finding out, you know, it can take months to figure out exactly what happened in January. You maybe don't find out till April. And then also deciding exactly when is this trough? That's kind of hard to see in the moment sometimes. But a uh, key point, we measure from peak to trough. So that was a smoothed out graph. Here is actual real GDP over time. You can see this would be the peak. We measure recession from peak to trough and that was the 2007-2009 recession. This was the most severe recession since the Great Depression, so we, we've called it the Great Recession. What's been unique about this past recession as well is that real GDP, real GDP growth after the recession has been slower to pick up than it typically is after a, uh, during an expansionary period. So how do we actually define a recession? There's not an official definition from the federal government. You often see in the me media two consecutive quarters of declining real GDP. And here are some examples pegged um, from history. The National Bureau of Economic Research defines a recession as a significant decline in activity spread across the economy lasting more than a few months, visible in industrial production, employment, real income, and wholesale retail trade.